us and for those who are online, we are glad that you are joining us there as well. Uh, if you are online and you have not yet, you go ahead and grab your communion supplies for a little bit later on, and uh, we will be participating in communion together. But let's open in a word of prayer this morning, and then we'll hear our opening scripture. Uh, gracious God, we come this morning to your house to worship. We come into your house this morning, Lord, as your people, uh, with our needs, with our joys, with our struggles, and our victories. We come as we are into your presence, uh, recognizing that you are here, and you are with us wherever we go. In this time, we ask that you reveal yourself to us in a very real and powerful way. Lord, as we come to worship and hear your word, may you open our hearts, may you open our minds to what you have to tell us and share with us. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's hear our opening scripture this morning. It comes from Psalm 138. It says, I will praise you, Lord, with all my heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. I will bow down toward your holy temple and will praise your name for your unfailing love and your faithfulness. For, all, for you have so exalted your solemn decree that it surpasses your fame. When I called, you answered me, and you greatly emboldened me. May all the kings of the earth praise you, Lord, when they hear what you have decreed. May they sing of the ways of the Lord, for the glory of the Lord is great. Though the Lord is exalted, he looks kindly on the lowly. Though lofty, he sees them from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the anger of my foes. With your right hand, you save me. The Lord will vindicate me. Your love, Lord, endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands. So as this morning we come, we will be praising God. And we do so this morning as we begin by singing joyful, joyful, uh, the joyful the one who saves.
common for God with everything we are, just as we are. It's, um, it's comforting and it's a little scary that God knows us better than we know ourselves. Even if we try to hide something, even if we try to keep something and keep our, our masks on before God, God knows us just as we are.
God, you are, you are so prevalent and present with us. We see your, your movement. We know your spirit is here with us. Lord, you have heard these prayer requests that have been shared, uh, both that have been vocalized here this morning. Now, would you lift up before you, Jamie and Rebecca, and all the fire crews, uh, not only that they're associated with, but that are on the fire lines in California, in Oregon, and, and elsewhere across this country. Uh, we thank you for their willingness to go and do these things, their willingness to share and to uh, just, just be in, in harm's way. We ask for their safety. We ask for their wisdom and discernment as they fight these fires. We pray, Lord, for uh, those who are battling cancer. Uh, we just ask for your, your hand upon them as they take the treatment as they do chemo or radiation. We just pray, Lord, for your healing in their lives. And we pray, Lord, uh, for comfort for Bonnie and, and the friends of Crystal and her family as well as we, as we, they mourn her loss. Lord, for the other prayer requests that have been shared and those that have our hearts, we just lift them before you and know that you hear us, know that you answer us, and know that your will is done in all things. We pray to you, Lord, for our community 
and our state and our country, Lord. We pray for our leaders, that you will give them wisdom and discernment. Lord, we pray for peace. And we know that uh, your word says that your people pray that you will bring healing. And so, Lord, we ask that you, you do bring healing. May it be as Jesus prayed that your will is done here on earth as it is in heaven. That your kingdom is here in this place. And may it begin with us. May we be bridge builders and peacemakers wherever we may go. And Lord, we just lift to you the blessings of our lives as well. For safety and travel. We pray for uh, just those who are still traveling. We pray, Lord, for uh, the blessings of outreach and of people uh, being able to be taken care of physically uh, with, with the dental bus and, and the food bank and other, other ways as well. We lift them all before you and just ask for your hand of grace and mercy to flow through us as a congregation, as your people flow through the churches of Dallas as we work together to be your people here in town. Our Lord, a special prayer is for the people who will be doing the schooling, uh, for teachers and administrators and, and all those who will be working to fi find the best way to educate the, the children at this time. And for the children, Lord, as they do online school to start with. Lord, may your hand be with them. May you lift them up and may you provide for them. We ask this all in Jesus' name. As we come uh, to the Word of God this morning, I want to share with you a, a passage of Scripture that asks a very important question for us. And it, it, not only is it a, a question that Jesus asked uh, the disciples, but it's a question that Jesus asks us as well that has ramifications for our everyday life, for everything that we do in our life. So this is a, this is a passage of Scripture from Matthew uh, 16, verses 13 through 20. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys to, of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. This is a great question that Jesus asked his disciples at that time. Question, who do people say that I am? And I'm sure that at this time in Jesus' ministry, he was, he was well known. People were familiar with who Jesus was. The crowds were following him, wanting to not only hear his teaching, but to understand his, uh, his words, to receive uh, healing. And as they did so, they began to formulate in their own mind, who, who is this guy? Who is this man who would come to listen to you? And so when Jesus asked his disciples, you know, who, do people say, who are people saying I am? And he said, well, some, say, some look at you and say you're Elijah or one of the other prophets. Uh, some say you're, you're Jonah. And then he asked this very personal question. Who do you say that I am? Who is it that you say that I am? And Peter, you know, we all know Peter's confession. You are the Messiah. You are the Christ. The Son of the living God. And Jesus said, replies and says, this was not given to you by anybody but the Spirit. This was revealed to you by God, my Father, your Father. You did not come to it by any power of your own any deductive reasoning, any logic of your own. But this was revealed to you by God. 
That's the revelation part of this text. It's the revelation. And when we make that confession of faith, when we say to, to one another, to ourselves, when we say that to Jesus himself, it, it, we are expressing a revelation that we have received from God. When we say, Jesus, you are the Christ, when we come up in front of, our, of the church and say, you know, I want to make that confession of faith and say, uh, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and my, my Lord and Savior. It's not something that we have come to on our own, but it's something that was revealed to us, given to us. Which kind of adds a different texture to it, at least for me. Because a lot of time we hear that you know, we've, we've come to this decision, we've come to this re realization on our own that you know, Jesus is the Christ. And we've looked at the evidence, we've looked at all this, these different things, we've heard the stories, all this stuff. But the reality is when we say those words, when we come to that place, it's not us that's coming to the place on our own. It's not ourselves that's coming to this, this realization. But it is what God is revealing to us, revealing in us, that Jesus is the Christ. And so, Peter has that revelation. And Peter vocalized that re revelation. And then, then Jesus says, I'm going to build my church on you. You are going to be the cornerstone, the rock, the, the building blocks of what I'm going to build here on earth, that what is going to be built here on earth. I can imagine Peter going, huh? What do you mean by that? I would have loved to sit, hear part of that conversation maybe even after this, this, what we have recorded happened. Can you imagine Peter pulling Jesus aside and saying, um, what? What did you mean by that? What did you mean that I'm going to be, be the builder of this church? I'm gonna, you're going to build your church on me. What is that? What, what are you talking about, Jesus? Because I think that revelation, when we make that that vocalization of that revelation, that there is not only internal consequences or ramifications or results, but there is very specific results that happen today, that happen and are lived out in our lives today. I don't think Peter or any of the other apostles knew what was in store for them as they went forward. They didn't know really what it was going to be like to see Jesus crucified and raised from the dead. They had no, I don't think they had any real understanding of what it was going to be like at Pentecost and how they were going to be changed and sent out. I don't think they had any real understanding of what it was going to be like for them as they went out. Some of the martyrs, martyrdom that was going to happen. Some of the things that was going to happen to them in their lives. I don't think they had much of a, an understanding of what that may have looked like. Yet that confession of faith, that empowerment of the Spirit there at Pentecost, put them on a path where they were completely transformed, where they grew, their lives were changed, and it had ramifications in their very earthly, everyday lives. They no longer could go back to be the people that they were before. The fishermen, the tax collectors, all, all those different jobs they went, went back to. They, although Peter and some of the other disciples went back to fishing after Jesus was crucified, there's nothing they could have done to go back to those things because of what God was doing in their lives. Which leads us to the second part of, of this message this morning. We see that God reveals that Jesus is the Christ to us. And when we confess that, when we acknowledge that, things have changed. Things change in our lives. Which leads us to Romans chapter 12. Paul writes to us and to the Roman church, to the church as a whole, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. 
Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to each one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment, in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Paul reminds us, Paul tells us, Alan Wright, that we are transformed. We are new creations. We are new creatures. And he says in this text alone that we are not to be conformed to the world. We do not continue in the way of the world. We do not continue in the way that we used to do things. We may continue in the same job. We may continue in the same path. Of, of employment or our family situation, yet we are different people, we are new creations, and we're called to live that way. Now what we do, when we are transformed and made new, we become new people. And we can't live that way any longer. We cannot continue in the way of the world anymore. So when Paul tells us here, you are to be a living sacrifice. You are to be a living sacrifice. Those two words seem to be very contradictory to one another. Usually when we talk about sacrifice, we, mean, uh, we think of putting something to death. You know, getting rid of it. We sacrifice something or someone, or you know, whatever the case might be. Yet when we hear those two words, living sacrifice, I really believe that Paul here is telling us that we are to be people who are willing to give up our past life, give up our past way of doing things, our past way of thinking about things, and begin that path of transformation that says, I'm no longer going to think about the way the world has done things, the way I used to do things according to the world. I'm no longer going to speak the way I used to speak or think the way I used to think. I'm no longer going to do the things that I used to do. I want to be transformed and begin to see the world as God sees the world. I want to begin to speak words of peace and encouragement and speak the words God's given to me. I want to begin to work in my life to do the things that God has called me to do. I want to do God's work. And whatever that might cost me, I want to follow what God has led me to and where God is leading me to, which is a really tough thing. It's very tough to do that. And we were talking in Sunday school this morning about our relationship with God. And we kind of ended where we talk about the different things that distract us from our faith. There's a lot of these things that distract us from our faith. Yet, when we say, I'm going to follow what God has called me to, we have to put those distractions aside. We have to realize that we come in relationship with God, and we move forward in relationship with God. That's what it means to be transformed. That's what it means to be a living sacrifice. And as we are transformed each day, as we are renewed each day, Paul reminds us that we begin to understand the will of God. We begin to know what God's will is for us, maybe for our community, our family, our church. We begin to understand the reality. We begin to understand the mind of God. Because that's what the Spirit reveals in us. So when we come this morning, when we come and we make that confession of faith, whether you did it yesterday, whether you did it 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, whatever that might have been, we come because we are that was revealed to us. But we move forward because of the response that we give, the change that makes in us. When we say, Jesus, you are the Christ, 
You are the Messiah. And I'm going to follow you. I want to follow you. That means that our lives from that moment begin to be different. And begin to be changed. And begin to be more Christ-like. I hope. I pray. It's not easy. And we make those transformations. Those transformations happen when we worship together. When we pray, when we seek out God's will for our lives, those transformations happen when we give up those things that are obviously of this world. Or even when we give up those things that are revealed to us that are not of God. We may hold certain things as a high priority and say, this is, this is so very important. And God tells us in that still quiet voice, no, that's really not that important. Darren, why don't you put that down? And pick up this over here. Take this path over here. That's much more important. It's tough. Because there are certain things that you and I want in our lives. There are certain things that are important to us that we hold dear God says, sometimes we'll say, put them down, for I have something greater for you. I have something for you to do. You can't do it if you're holding on to this past stuff. So when we talk about what it means to make that confession of faith, we may not know what the future holds. We may, not, we may be like the apostles, the disciples, who when they made that confession of faith had no clue what their future held, what, it was, what that meant. I can probably say, for, at least for me, that when I made that confession of faith growing up, I had no idea what God had planned for me. Yet as I try and work to follow what God puts before me, how God leads me, it's a, it's a time of transformation. It's a time of transformation of my heart, of my mind, of my words, of my actions. And we are transformed each and every day. And I'm reminded of what uh, the prophet Micah says. You know, what, what does God want from us? To love mercy, to do justice, to walk humbly with God. You know, in many ways, that's the same thing that Jesus says when Jesus says, when, when, when asked, what are the greatest commandments? To love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbors yourself. Tough things to do. But if that's the calling you have, and I believe it is, when Jesus, when we say, Jesus, you're the Christ, we have to begin to work in those ways. We have to begin to live in those ways. We have to begin to realize what God is doing in us and through us in ways that are so important and so necessary. I want you to take some time this week to think about what it means for you, what it has meant for you to say, Jesus, you are the Christ. I don't know when you made that initial confession of faith. But probably each day we need to say, we need to make that confession. We need to say, whether we do it out loud, whether we do it in prayer, or whether we do it in our own hearts and minds, say, Jesus, you are the Christ. What does that mean? Where does that lead you? What revelation and response do you have that day? And go and do it. Go and do the things that God has put before you. Go and be the people of God in the world today in ways that make a difference in the world today. Be the women and the men and the, the, the children of God that we are called to be. Each one of us has different gifts, different parts to play. Yet we are the body of Christ, with Christ as the head. Go and play your part in that as the body of Christ. Go and be the men and women of God. Go and be peacemakers. Go and be 
be agents of grace and love as God has given you grace and love in all that you do, in everything that happens. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, we come this morning knowing that it is in your hands that we place our lives. As we have made our confession of faith and, and claim that Jesus is the Messiah, Lord, we come this morning to seek out your direction and your will as we are transformed and led as the body of Christ. May our response to your revelation be one that brings you glory and honor. And may we trust in you and may our faith be in you in all things. And we ask this in Jesus' name. As we come to the table this morning, we come recognizing that God uh, led Jesus to this table. God led Jesus to this table in, a, in preparation for his arrest and crucifixion. And at that table, Jesus uh, took his disciples. And as they were eating, he took a loaf of bread. And he blessed it. He said, this, is, this bread is my body, which is given for you. Whenever you eat it, remember me. I invite you to take your, your communion elements. Let's take the bread. Recognizing this is the body of Christ, which is given for us. Let's eat together. Jesus then took a cup from the table and he blessed it. He said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink it, says, remember me. Let's drink together.
course, lead our community today. As we prepare to uh, close this morning, our benediction, our closing song is, I will follow. It's a declaration that we will follow where God leads us. And that as agents of God's uh, kingdom, as members of his body, we will do as God has, has called us to do. Uh, Marsha, are you aware of any announcements? Um, You've been out of the loop, yeah. Uh, I want to say thank you to Nelda again and to Shell Hill for their help in the dental van. Uh, Shell does a great job of scheduling, and Nelda was here as the host yesterday as we served, uh, or as the dental man served seven, seven patients, treated seven patients. And it's a wonderful outreach that, that we can host and be a part of. And every time that we have it, uh, people are just amazed at, at what they do and how they, how they can do the, those things uh, there. So thank you for all that work. Will you join now in singing, I will fall. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. I will follow you. I will follow you.